Our first presentation of this afternoon is Frederico and Michael talking about Ceph. So thank you very much. Please welcome them. Thank you. Oops. All right. Uh, my name is Federico Lucifredi. I work at Red Hat. I'm a product management uh, person, so I basically plan future releases of products for those of you that don't understand corporate. And um, Mike is part of our team in uh, in the Global Services Organization. Yeah, Mike Hackett. I work out of Westford. I work for the uh, support team. I'm also the support product lead, where basically I do a lot of interaction with uh, the product team and um, get that feedback on what I hear from customers and what we see in support. So the aim is um, to give you a very quick introduction to Ceph. Ceph is a very broad subject. It's like giving an introduction to the kernel in 15 minutes. So uh, we're definitely not going to cover everything, but we're going to try to give you an idea of what Ceph is if you're new to the subject and go into a couple of um, specific areas of what makes Ceph cool, um, hopefully to uh, increase your interest in it. And then we're happy to take questions as we go, so just don't be afraid to interrupt. Hopefully the, the audio system works well and you can hear me throughout the room, but if you're trying to ask a question, you may want to come up a little bit forward so we can hear you. Oh, there is a microphone. Excellent. So, um, accidentally, by background, I uh, worked in open source my entire career, except a couple of years where I was in academia, and I was in academia here at Boston University, so it's kind of nice to be back here. Um, but it's, been, it's apparently been long enough that I don't remember where things are, so I got lost. Now, um, let's look at uh, storage a little bit. Uh, compute is where all the cool stuff of computing happens. Ceph makes storage cool. That's my way to look at it. But for most people, storage is something that just has to work. Um, we like to think of Ceph as the future of storage for a number of reasons, but you may also think of it as Linux for storage. So Linux has been able to span over the last 30 years from just a hobby project to about 10 years ago to run web servers and uh, print servers and file servers and that was about it to the situation where we're now where you can run um, supercomputers to watches and anything in between with Linux. Uh, Ceph is a very good architecture that promises the same potential for storage but we're in the early days so if you stretch the metaphor you could think of Ceph as the 2.4 kernel. We can do some things very well, and there are some things that we will be able to do, but we don't do now. Um, so, how does, um, how does this all pan out? I'm going to try to do the marketing thing super quick, but it's not so much um, about marketing, it's about situating the conversation. So, Ceph is the future of storage. Okay, what is the past of storage? Originally, you would record information on stone tablets. Maybe there was a chisel or something. Pen and ink is the next, next technology. Today, much more opaque technology is sitting between you and your data. Um, the point here is that working through a computer means you can store more information and that we can access it more quickly. But it also means that you're separated even further from the information you've created. It's intermediated by technology. You cannot pick off the disks of a platter with tweezers, so to speak. You need the hardware to decode it. Um, the whole point can be concisely expressed this way. Technology intermediates access between you and your data. The second point um, is that everyone that has a CIO office has seen a chart like this in the last few years. There is a data explosion going on. Everything gets logged everywhere. Nobody throws away anything, regardless of how much information may actually be in that um, stored material. Keep everything. And the result is <clears throat> scary amounts of data. And here is the old way to store this data. You connect a bunch of disks to a computer, give humans access, uh, multi-user OS, time sharing, and all that revolutionary 60s technology comes in. And, of course, it looks more like this as things scale out. 
and you get lots of users. The result is that um, you then need to scale up the system to keep up with demand. Here you see all the classic optimization problems. How can we make the same architecture do more kind of question. This justifies really expensive, costly hardware on performance grounds and is technically and economically broken in the face of the amount of data that we're seeing today. And I'm getting notifications from my calendar, so let me kill it. Um, but here is an alternative. Instead of making what you have today bigger, you take what you have today and add many units of it. Let's call that making it broader instead of bigger. This is scaling out instead of scaling up. And the units remain as cheap as they were to begin with. You're not buying the giant spendy computer, you're buying many uh, small cheap computers. You multiply the number of these cheap units And eventually, the industry figured out how to make appliances <coughs> powered by this architectural model. You take the lots of computers and lots of disks, put them in a box, and they become a storage appliance. You forklift it into your data center, plug in a cable. This is a storage appliance, an actual physical thing that kind of looks like this. And it's usually very proprietary. <coughs> Even when there is open source in there, you probably can't touch that code. And it's probably BSD, so you don't even see what that code is. Here is what's inside the typical storage appliance. The hardware is proprietary, not your typical Dell or HP x86 uh, industry standard hardware. Then on top of it is software, also proprietary. And then you have your support and services contract. As an aside, here is a breakdown. Uh, the animation is a little bit slow here. As an aside, here is a breakdown of what used to be uh, the market leader, EMC, before it was acquired by, uh, by Dell. It is a very big business. And the reason for this is that, as we like to say, when you lose a compute, compute server, you buy a new server. When you lose your storage server, you update your resume. So people take storage very seriously, and that makes it easier to monetize. What has happened since this model was most successful is that the cloud has started raining bits on CIO's heads, the um, up and up and to the left chart that I was showing before. We're here today because there is an inflection point and something has to change. So here is what we propose with software defined storage and Ceph. We favor standard hardware that you already know and are familiar with, open soft software on top of that, and an enterprise subscription on top of that, optionally. If you need it, that is, as always, in the open source model. And so this is what Ceph is use compute hardware with the right number of disks from your favorite compute vendor and then you run Ceph to make it into a storage fabric. So what, what is really Ceph? What are the principles behind it? First, we wanted it to be open source, and it is the best way to get technology in the hands of people who can use it quickly. <coughs> Secondly, we wanted this to be community-focused open source, not throw it over the wall open source. And this focus has resulted in an unusually vibrant community for an enterprise, uh, for an enterprise class product like storage. Technically, we also wanted it to be scalable, and in the scale-out fashion, not in the scale-up fashion. Um, part of being scalable is having no single point of failure in a scale-out design. Ceph has none. And most importantly, Ceph was designed to be self-managing. So as the system scales out and out, you don't have to hire an army of system administrators to manage. You keep the number of people involved in the project relatively stable. That is the intent 
course, as we go from one order of magnitude to the other, there is always new work to be done to manage the increase in scale. Right now, we're uh, at, uh, as a business, Red Hat is fairly comfortable with clusters of five to 10 petabytes of storage. In the community, there, there have been clusters as large as CERNs that I believe went to 60 petabytes. And is, so there, there is a push for the 100 petabyte barrier. But right now, in enterprise use, I think five to 10 is where we're most comfortable with. We're trying to automate and harden things so that, if necessary, we can use that scale in enterprise scenarios as well. At that point, it becomes a question of whether the customer really wants one cluster or multiple clusters, but it's good to be technically prepared. It is software-based, so it's compatible with any hardware you choose. Now, of course, if you choose the wrong hardware, the performance will suck. Uh, there is no point uh, around that. In fact, the most important thing that you can get from a vendor for Ceph is reference architectures in terms of what hardware you should be using for what use case. Uh, we already discussed self-managing, so um, this is a chart of where the commits are going, and they are pretty much continuing that way. We're actually very satisfied with the way Ceph has a, um, built a robust community with a lot of vendors in it. This is not a one uh, vendor uh, open source project. We have Intel, we have SUSE, Canonical, uh, Mirantis, Oracle is distributing, but probably not contributing as much. So all the Linux vendors are there, hardware vendors, Intel, um, um, system makers like Supermicro and Quanta have been particularly visible. Micron has worked with us recently, uh, Fujitsu. And there are a lot, really a lot of participants in the community and that makes it also interesting in the sense that if you don't like one vendor, you can choose another. This is not, um, something where you're being locked in by lack of choices. So uh, this is essentially what Ceph is. It is a distributed storage cluster with three interfaces. If you need object storage, you use the Ceph object gateway. That provides the Amazon AWS S3 interface or the uh, OpenStack Swift interface. Uh, S3 is by far mo the most popular, of course, outside of our OpenStack use case everybody's using S3. In terms of how does the user base look like right now, in terms of the customers that we work with, um, about half of them are doing OpenStack, and they're using Ceph to provide all of the storage interfaces for OpenStack. So um, Cinder, Glance, Nova Ephemeral, um, Swift, and um, soon Manila. Oh, actually, as of last month, Manila too. Um, and the other big part of the user base are customers that want to have an Amazon AWS S3 compatible cluster in-house. Now, we're not legally allowed to make, um, uh, to make claims as to compatibility because our legal department doesn't like it. However, um, there is another vendor that's making claims of compatibility with Amazon AWS S3, and they claim to be the most compatible. We recently found out that they use our test suite to make these claims. So that must say something about our compatibility. Generally speaking, Amazon S3 is not a standard. So uh, there is no line that you cross and you're finished. Amazon can add whatever they want whenever they want. So it's always an unfinished uh, race. But it turns out it doesn't really matter because the new features from Amazon are new and so people are not using them yet. As long as you prioritize things in the right order, uh, the lack of a standard is not an actual problem. Uh, the other interfaces are RBD for block. Uh, that is manifested as libRBD in a library form or KRBD as a kernel driver. And um, um, CephFS is the uh, POSIX file system interface. So if you need a file system abstraction, you can actually have it out of a distributed cluster, which is technically very cool, but it's not very prevalent in the user base right now. At least not in the enterprise user base. There is a significant more use in the community. So here are the interfaces uh, with the original technical names uh, instead of the marketing ones. So RGW, Rados Gateway, is the object gateway in the, in the um, 
more marketing terminology. RBD, RADOS block device, is the block interface. Let's start with RADOS. RADOS is a distributed object store and it's the foundation for Ceph. <clears throat> On top of RADOS, the Ceph team has built these three interfaces that allow, that allow you to store data and do amazing things. But before we get into all of that, let's uh, go to the beginning. RADOS is a reliable, autonomous, distributed object store comprised of self-healing, self-managed, intelligent storage nodes. So what, does, what the heck does that mean? Here is how it works. If I have five disks, these could be spinning media, could be solid state, could even be RAID volumes, although that is typically not a good idea. We have five file systems on top of these disks, ButterFS, ext4, xfs are the ones in common use, xfs is the one in most common use. Um, then you have five OSDs, object storage daemons, one per disk. This is a software layer that makes each disk part of the Ceph storage cluster. This is a simple piece of software, you configure it with a path and it exposes that path as a storage location to the cluster. So, so then, this at the bottom would be your Ceph cluster, and you have, let's say, two dozen hosts. Each host has a certain number of disk drives, in this case, five. Uh, most common scenario is probably 12 for high performance, could be as high as 60 for a more cheap and deep configuration. And. Um, this presentation is built around using consistent iconography, so these blue boxes will be OSDs going forward since we have a number of, of um, demons in the system. Of course, when you interact with the storage cluster, you interact with an entire cluster as a single logical unit, not as a series of hosts. Otherwise, it would be rather messy. In the previous diagrams, we had two types of cluster members. The blue box with the red bar represents an OSD node. Each OSD provides access to a path in the cluster, usually a disk. This is the component that is responsible for providing access to the data. It is also responsible for peering with other nodes in the cluster to replicate the data. When a drive fails, recovery is also performed by the OSD working in peer-to-peer -peer fashion to replicate and rebalance data with other OSD nodes in the cluster. Monitors, the black boxes with an M of which we had three in the previous cluster design. Monitors instead control cluster state. They know the state of each node at any given point in time. You generally want a number of these and a small number because they vote using Paxos. Critically, they are not part of the data path. Writing or reading data does not involve the monitors in any way. Otherwise, there would be a big scalability bottleneck here. But there isn't. So that's RADOS underneath. All of Ceph is built on this underlying layer. The use useful applications are built on top of it. Um, starting with LibRADOS, that provides you with native ability for storage, um, for data storage and retrieval. This could be the, the easiest way for you to write a Ceph application. Just use the primitives of the cluster directly. And this is um, the highest performance way to access uh, Ceph storage. So if you're really willing to put in your effort and optimize for this type of storage, very large scale, um, there were users that have done this work uh, because it paid off to actually write a custom application. It's not REST-based or anything like that. It is a fast native protocol. It provides you with fast direct access to storage via language-specific bindings, usually. So you're writing a custom Ceph application. And you can do pretty cool stuff with it. Um, it's actually worth a, a presentation of its own to see how to code directly with RADOS. <coughs> Built on top of LibRADOS is RGW, the RADOS gateway that I was saying um, half of the customers are using to provide S3. 
RGW provides a liberators interface on the southbound side, but a REST interface on the northbound side to the application, specifically in the form of DS3 and Swift protocols. That makes Ceph compatible with anything that's been written for S3 or Swift. It makes it a lot easier to bring applications to this type of storage. These are all obviously network communication uh, based. RGW is an object store proxy. It is a thin layer translating REST to a direct RADOS call. It then uses RADOS to store or retrieve data, but using the semantics of S3 or Swift to the client. It also integrates with Keystone for authentication in OpenStack environments, and it supports buckets, accounting, and the usual trimmings of um, a common user-facing object store. Next up is RBD, the RADOS block device. This is the other very popular service, the one uh, that everyone in OpenStack is using. Regardless of whether they're using the other services, all of them are using block storage. This is most immediately interesting for those of you standing up clouds. Here's how it works. If I have little bits of a volume spread across the cluster in four megabyte chunks, RBD will link into the virtualization layer, into KVM, and present those as a single disk. Striping a volume across the cluster in this way, RBD provides the illusion of a single volume. It also can provide NFS, um, uh, this is not in the right, um, it can also be used to layer on top NFS or some or other protocols on top of these volumes, but you would do this in the virtualization layer. The important thing is that because you're getting the block storage this way, all of the OpenStack interfaces can consume libRBD for block. And that's how our integration with OpenStack is done. Now, I don't have a marketing slide for this in this deck, but about half of all OpenStack storage is Ceph. Um, and the closest second ranked, uh, use, uh, second ranked uh, product is uh, LVM, which is used only by developers. And then when you look at another enterprise alternative, we're looking at 12, 13% level of use. So while there is this big chunk of Ceph use, the rest is basically a long tail of a lot of different choices. And the reason for Ceph's popularity in OpenStack is this deep integration. Ceph is integrated with every single system in OpenStack, and it's not integrated as an afterthought, okay, we'll make it work. It is also actually integrated the right way, so it provides the right performance. Greg, who is actually in the audience, gave a very interesting talk a few months ago about questions you should ask your storage vendor to make them squirm. <laughs> and if you uh, look at his talk, uh, those are the kind of integration questions that you can use to probe whether the integration was done because the marketing checkbox was needed or to actually make things work correctly. <clears throat> This lets us do uh, very interesting things. As the storage is not directly attached to the VM, we can suspend on one physical hypervisor and restore on another migration. And if your hypervisor supports it, live migrate a VM because the storage does not need to move. This is something we're used to by now. Um, but this is coming from an open source storage layer. Another way you can do this is via the kernel module, KRBD, which has been in the upstream kernel for quite a while. It mounts an RBD volume as storage you can mount in dev, uh, make a file system on, and treat just like a normal disk. But it is actually distributed on your cluster, giving you parallelism in your reads and replication of data protection if one of the drives fails. A very robust way to store disks. Uh, this also uh, gives you a general purpose way to use this from bare metal. Uh, so if you're not in a virtualized environment, the, the KRBD driver is the way you expose these volumes to bare metal. Okay, so let's see what, what do I have left. Uh, the RADOS block device, storage of disk image in RADOS, decouples the VM from the host. A powerful concept as we described. Um, the drive is striped across the RADOS cluster. 
across the storage pool to be exact, which is a mid-level abstraction of the of the entire cluster. It's not the entire cluster storage, it's a part of it. Uh, with some properties like certain type of replication and resiliency is inherent to the pool. One could be erasure coded, another one could be replicated. You can snapshot these virtual images, operate on copy on write mode. Ultimately, you could say that RBD is responsible for such success. Um, the large percentage of OpenStack deployments that use Ceph RBD for storage, more than any other technology, are primarily using RBD. And then we have the final service, which is um, CephFS. This is a distributed, horizontally scalable POSIX compliant file system built on top of RADOS. Now, um, this gets interesting technically because um, the data we can do the same way we do uh, RBD, but where is the metadata for the file system coming from? The metadata is stored in the RADOS cluster, just like any other data, but it is interpreted by the MDS, these uh, new gray icons that I have in the cluster. It's a different daemon. Um, and clients accessing files on CephFS first make a request to the MDS to understand the directory structure. It provides them what they need um, to understand uh, the directory structure and the metadata associated with the files. Again, the data path is not going through the MDS, the data path is going directly to the OSD, but the directory abstraction is coming from the MDS. So this gives us the ability to scale metadata operations independently of data operations, which is pretty cool for workloads that are super high on metadata operations. Uh, but it's also um, nice in general because you can scale the two uh, independently. You don't have to add metadata operations, uh, operation support if you don't use it. So if you are not using CephFS, you have no MDSs in the cluster. If you're using the file system lightly, you just have a few. If you're beating the crap out of the file system, you have a lot. You can um, scale accordingly. And as I was saying, the data and the metadata come independently from different parts of the cluster, so that is also not the bottom. So not in the data path, this design allows management of all the metadata required by a file system to happen as a separate unit, and enables scaling out the logic just like our architecture requires. Um, now, I described Ceph as um, magic in some level in terms of the fact that it can scale arbitrarily far, uh, but I didn't explain how this happens and what the underlying technology is. I just gave you the terminology and what the components of the cluster are. Uh, and I tried to point out that there are no bottlenecks in the, in the architecture I described. But uh, Mike will actually give you a little bit of detail of some of the components underneath so that you can get an idea of how Ceph does uh, its magic. So now that uh, Federico gave us an overview of Ceph and the components, um, I'm going to give a little bit into what makes it unique. So one of the first things that makes Ceph different is, is how we place the data. So let's say we need to store data into a whole lot of computers with a whole lot of disks. Uh, many designs resolve this problem by placing a server that directly is in the middle of the access of the data path. This isn't a scalable solution. There are fundamentally two approaches that we could look at in solving these type of placement and retrieval issues. So the way that we're going to look at these, these two types of issues is I'm going to use a metaphor. Basically, how long did it take you to find your keys this morning? <laughs> so we can remember usually where we put our keys, or we can always put our keys in the same exact place. So I said that there's two ways to look at this. So the first way to do this is basically we talk to some centralized metadata server somewhere. We ask that metadata server for the location of a given object, it returns back to us, and we connect over there to retrieve the object. So if we take a look here, this one's actually the fourth box from the top. We go over to the fourth box on the top, and we get the data. So in other words, there's somebody in the middle that's keeping track of where that data is.
So this is what uh, Ross Turk likes to call the dead diary. Today I put my keys on the kitchen counter type method. But imagine if you were doing that at scale, how large that diary would be. But this is effectively what most of the enterprise storage arrays are doing. The second method is to basically split up your cluster. Have a standard coordinate frame for the whole entire cluster and break it up similar to what you do with encyclopedias. In this case, we can see maybe we're looking for a file that, uh, or, or a data structure with the name of F. So we know that location is in between the A and G encyclopedic area. Um, looking at this, though, if you have multiple objects uh, or data inside, say, the Z, we might have a very small encyclopedia, or something inside A would be a very large encyclopedia. This is what we like to call, let's put all our keys and the hooks by the door method. So what we're looking at here is how do we find our keys when the house is infinitely big and it's constantly changing. The way that Ceph does this is through something we call the crush algorithm. Crush is, is a um, control replication of the scalable hashing, which is where storage starts to look more like a peer-to-peer -peer sharing program, OSDs, peer-to-peer -peer sharing information, and the traditional big storage vendors. So crushes the algorithm, but how does it work? So the first thing we do is we need to decide what placement group an object is going to belong to. And we do that by taking the object name, hashing the object name, running it against the crush algorithm on the placement group, and then pass it to the cluster set and a rule set. The cluster set and the rule set are held inside the monitors. So the monitor holds that information. Based upon that, the algorithm decides where the data is going to live on the cluster. That's basically which OSDs I'm going to put that data on the cluster. You don't need to talk to um, the, the monitor specifically to get your data location after the initial client connects to the cluster because once the client connects to the cluster, he gets all of the mapping information um, and, and he'll know the object's location. So what's the result of, of, of crush hashing and placing the data? So our results is statistically a uniform distribution of data throughout the cluster. That's a pseudo-random data type placement. Um, statistically uniform distribution across the OSDs in the cluster. A stable mapping of the data. And, and with a stable mapping of the data, we're looking at a limited data migration on change. That's based upon rule sets and things along those uh, along those lines because uh, uh, Ceph utilizes some, on some, uh, upon something called pools, where basically your data is placed into specific pools. Um, right there, it's, it's a rule-based configuration. You can assign different rule sets uh, to different pools where they can place um, data on different types of media. If you need a high-performance pool, you can place, you can have a rule set specifically for that pool to talk to your SSDs and VMEs, for example. Or if you have a low latency based application, you can assign a rule set to, say, a, a 7.2K slower HDD. So let's take a, a, a high level look at what happens if a client needs to find a piece of data. So basically, the client's going to run through the algorithm, algorithm find that there are two copies of data. And they're there without asking any type of intermediate metadata server in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the build. So um, this actually has a, a little typo there. That second arrow there actually should be going to the green block. <laughs> so, this was a colorblind mistake. <laughs> Let's go a little bit deeper now into how this is actually going to really work, right? So let's say we have an object, that object's name is foo, and it's assigned to the bar pool. First of all, what's going to happen is we're going to hash the object name of foo 
and decide that based upon that object's name, it's going to belong in placement group 23. So we assign placement group 23 to pool 3. So that's why we pass the, the placement group name is 3.23. So 3, the first number inside your placement group is actually your pool location. We pass that, that newly generated placement group ID into the crush algorithm. The crush is going to calculate um, by looking at your, your crush rule sets, um, OSD mapping and things along those lines. And it's going to tell us what the target OSDs are for that pool. And it's going to go and it's going to place the data on those OSDs. This all happens in client libraries, and it is, um, there's none of your code that's actually doing this. It's all, it's all um, look, um, the rattles doing all this. So if we, if we look here, our target OSDs were a primary 24, and a uh, secondary and, and uh, a tertiary OSDs of 3 and 12. And all those OSDs would be inside a rule set residing in, in um, uh, pool 3. So let's have a look at this cluster here. We have 10 nodes. One of our nodes has a failure. So your OSDs, uh, your peer OSDs, are always watching the cluster and working cooperatively inside the cluster. They're sending heartbeats in between the OSDs to understand if an OSD is still reachable. If an OSD goes down for a period of time, we get this information. Um, uh, no peers responding to heartbeat requests, for example. Uh, all the monitors will come to a, a, um, an agreement basically saying that yes, this OSD hasn't been reachable for a defined period of time, which is equitable value uh, five minutes by default, and it basically marks that OSD as up. So what happens when that OSD gets marked as up? So what happens is basically the cluster auto-rebalances the placement of the data and creates new replicas on other OSDs that reside inside that same crush rule set for that pool. So it's going to move our, our, our red data there and our yellow data to another OSD. Now say we have 100 nodes and lose one of those 100 nodes. Only 100 of that data needs to be moved. Or in other words, one end of the data gets moved. So one part of the data and the number of nodes that needs to be moved. As this is, it's a, it's a many to many movement, this can be remarkably efficient as you have multiple nodes participating in the activity. So how does the client know where the data actually resides now? So the clients basically ask the monitor and they get a, a, a new cluster map to know the new locations of where the data actually is. So if, we, if, if you think about this, Federico said that Ceph to a point can be magical. Um, we like to think about the crush algorithm and where it's actually placed in the data as a, a magical way of how we're distributing the data. And it takes a, a large understanding of peer-to-peer um, -peer systems and, and things along those lines to understand how it places the data. So we just like to give it the, it's a magical way of doing it. <laughs> So what else makes Ceph unique? We like to think about thin provisioning uh, as, as part of the uh, a secondary thing that makes Ceph unique. So what do we mean by thin provisioning? So what I'm talking about is, is how we deal with layering and cloning on block devices. So Federico showed this slide earlier where um, we have blocks spread across a cluster. The RBD, RBD collects them into a, into a volume and presents that volume as, say, a single device to, a, to a, uh, a VM. But what we're really looking at isn't something as simple as that, right? What we're looking at is a large number of clients, dozens to hundreds of VMs. So how, when facing this larger scale, do we spin up VMs efficiently? We do that with layering.
So let's have a look here. This is this will be a, this is one, an RBD volume. We have 144 units of storage in this RBD volume. I'm not going to label not going to label the storage units as kilobytes, megabytes, or terabytes. We'll just call them storage units. So with RBD, we can we can copy these images as many times as we need to. Twice, three times, four times, and it's not going to take up any additional space in the cluster until you actually start writing to those additional copies. But they still take up this. Um, as we write to the additional copies, but they're still taking the same original space as that uh, original copy. Give me an example here. It's real of Spain. <laughs> Too many. <laughs> So if we have a look here, we've taken four copies of our original RBD device, just some copies. We can look at each size of those four copies is zero. Size is still equal to 144 storage units. client comes in and needs to start writing new data for these images, they're going to be writing for the copy. It's the same, same thing along the lines with reads, unless that, pri that, that copy um, doesn't have, say, a new write that came in and the client needs to, to read off that, that new write that came in. Obviously, the, the, um, the, the original won't have it, so it will, it will read off the, um, it, it can read off the master. So basically, if the, the um, the, the, the secondary copy doesn't have a copy of the, the data that the client's requesting to read and can read off the master. Would, would that work for files as well? On CephFS? Or is this only block device? This is block device. This, this is only RBD. block device. This is only for RBD. Yeah. Uh, So looking at this, it's, it's, it's basically a layered block device. It's thin provisioning, copy on write. We can give it many names that we can see in enterprise storage. And um, it, what, what basically matters there is how it's implemented and what the technology is. It's extremely powerful. It can make your storage use effective and efficient. And not to mention, you don't need to wait for any of the copies to actually take place. We just you can make instantly make four copies of that single copy of data. And even only with the uh, the, the, the certain writes coming in, we've only grew four storage units. So that's basically just a, a high level of, of crush and a high level of basically um, thin provisioning and layering with RBD. Wow, we're actually on time. Even with the delay. That's really <laughs> impressive. <laughs> so I, I had to fly, I didn't know how fast. <laughs> yeah, the end. Uh, the delays of LibreOffice not being able to take too many animations are always back. So yeah, that's always great. Right <laughs> so there is um, there are a couple of links for resources um, for things that you can look at if you are curious and. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have any uh, questions? So does uh, Lustre, the traditional Lustre file system follow the the diary analogy of the metadata server says where every single file or object is or something? Uh, Lustre or Gluster? Lustre. I have Greg say yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Mostly. I think, I think they're, they've gotten more advanced recently, but mostly yes. Mm -hmm. They write everything down. Yep. Another question, though? So, moment. at work, you know, we're currently using one of those uh, proprietary scale-up uh, servers. Um, 
and I want us to adopt, let's say, let's say either Ceph or Gluster. But the biggest uh, like complaint from a senior engineer is that he wants something that he considers to be quote unquote dumb. I think he's <laughs> thinking in terms of like, you know, like simplicity of like of maintaining the software and like the you know the, the implementation state. Like he doesn't want just like oh we went into the, like with many applications you say your database gets corrupt and then your application is broken. You know, he's, uh, how would you address the complaints that no Luster, uh, or, or, sorry Gluster and stuff are not as uh, simple or dumb as. I this think, it, I think it's a fair it's a fair comment. I mean, they're not as simple uh, or as dumb as an appliance. It's kind of what I was saying when I said that we're in the 2.4 kernel era. Mm -hmm. You have to wait until we get to kernel 4 for things to be fully. But there are ways you can be smart about it when you're using it today. If you're trying to use uh, Cepher Gluster for applications that they are poorly suited for, you're basically setting yourself up for failure. So the first thing to do is choosing software-defined storage for the right application. Typical example is, I'm running Oracle. I really want to run it against Ceph. Well, keep using the appliance you already have. That is not the problem you should be tackling, right? But if you have a problem like um, you ha need OpenStack storage or you need an S3 compatible store with Ceph, that is something we do well. Um, similarly, Gluster has its own sweet spots. That's the second consideration. Then there is the third one, which is, I think, what your colleague was pointing at most directly, which is, how do I manage it easily? So over the years, we've tried to make things easier and lower the bar from, I need to be a distributed system expert to use Ceph, to I can be a DevOps administrator to use Ceph. We haven't brought it down all the way to uh, I have a, a NetApp appliance that has a CD drive and one button, and all that I do is put CDs in the tray and press this one button. But we've brought it down to a more reasonable level. You can install it using Cephansible, uh, a set of playbooks that are pre-configured that pretty much any DevOps administrator should be comfortable using. We have monitoring tools um, as of that last year, uh, Cephmetric project in particular, Cephmetrics project in particular, which gives you a very good overview of what's going on in the cluster so that you can troubleshoot performance problems or see what parts of uh, uh, or components need to be scheduled for um, weekly or monthly maintenance. And we're working on the third part, which is a UI so that you can uh, not necessarily know as much about how Ceph works internally, but you can give instructions like I need to create a storage pool or I need to allocate a volume for the user over there. That is stuff that we're still working on. Uh, we expect that um, a lot of work is happening upstream on this right now. We expect that it's going to be in the enterprise products by the end of the year. So to, to elaborate a little bit on that, a lot of ease manageability stuff is, is going to be automated by Ceph itself, right? So with Luminous, we have something called storage classes, where when you create an OSD, Ceph is, is able to identify whether that OSD is an HDD or an SDD. And when you create your rule sets, it used to be Creating a crush rule set is, you feel like you need to go to school for <laughs> a week, two weeks just to learn how to do that. Um, it's actually a lot simpler now. We can assign a storage class to that rule set and basically say, take SSD. Instead of having to go in there, put all in all your hosts, your SSD locations, and things along those lines, I can just say, take SSD, and it will take any of the SSDs assigned to that, to that storage class. And then, and then also what we're doing now in Luminous is basically uh, different types of media will have different types of configurations by default assigned to them. So recovery used to be a problem in, say, Firefly and Hammer, where uh, recovery was too aggressive, right? You'd have to tune down your recovery operations. We actually, in, in, in Luminous, we default to, to lower recovery operations on the HDDs and, and higher on the SSDs, because an SSD is able to process more operations than an HDD. So all that's done now automatically with Ceph. We're actually looking to auto, in the future, we're looking to auto balance placement groups and things along those lines as well. So there's a lot of work going into ease and manageability being automatically auto done by Seth. And then also Seth, um, Seth Medic, which Federico also said, also um, points out any um, configurations that aren't, say, optimal. So basically, we assign a set of rules inside there that, that we'll look for. Basically, if you have HDDs and you're, and you're running the say, replica value of two, we'll say, hey, we don't recommend this. Just basically something like that. That, that kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier, that automation needs to be part of an infinitely scalable system because 
otherwise the complexity of managing the system overruns you. It's not just a matter of making it easy or making it dumb. It's also a matter of when you have thousands of uh, nodes to manage, those things have to be self-managing for things to remain the same. So as we move forward, more and more things are automated in increasingly higher complexity, either because of scale or because we want to lower the bar to the system administrators of um, the way I look at the user personas are distributed system experts, usually they come from OpenStack world, or uh, the more naive users, which usually are traditional storage, uh, storage administrators. And even if they have the expertise to look inside the system, they don't want to. Their mandate is not to fiddle with what's inside their storage system, it's just to watch it and make sure it's safe. And they're culturally averse to going uh, into too much detail, they don't see it as part of their job, so we have to isolate them a little bit more. And creating tools is, is the way we do it for that user base. That's particularly visible in the S3 part of the user base. Here are a few resources. Um, the way we like to jumpstart clusters is with the Cephansible project. Um, uh, that is uh, pretty good on both across uh, CentOS, Ubuntu, and most distributions, but CentOS rather than Ubuntu primarily. Uh, I believe that uh, the Ubuntu community uh, goes to Juju as their default standby to build um, a starter cluster, so that could be another way to do it. There is a lot of documentation upstream if you want to poke at things, so definitely go and surf around the docs. So, uh, Ceph now supports erasure coding in all three types of storage you guys provide. Um, yes. How would you compare a rebuild of a failed disk compared to a conventional RAID array? Um, well, in comparing which way with a rebuild of a RAID array? Uh, how long it's going to take, how many, uh, how many um, mm. disks are participating in a rebuild, and uh, also uh, what's the performance impact on the system while the build is happening? So, the whole load is going to be lower because you're looking at chunks that are being lost by using a drive instead of full replicas in the three replica scheme. Um, so the load on the cluster is going to be better with EC. The performance in EC is generally going to be bad. That's a trait of erasure coding across pretty much anybody's storage. Um, obviously, if you're doing straight replicas, it's higher performance than erasure coding. Now, um, I think that we can do better than we are, where we are right now in terms of EC performance. We have had EC uh, for a number of years on the object store side, and we have a lot of users there. With Blue Store going to general availability in the community last year and uh, in our product at the end of this year, uh, erasure coding becomes available for block and for file. But um, there it's a question of choosing, choosing trade-offs. Uh, Mike was discussing pools earlier looking at the algorithm. So you can have different storage pools on the same cluster, one using Replica 3 and another one using Erasure Coding, and you allocate the workload to the correct pool for the performance level they require. You don't have to choose. So you size the cluster for the maximum performance you need at the three replica, but you're also able to provide lower performance using uh, Erasure Coding out of another pool for things like backups or snapshots or what have you. I think that we can do better as we have more experience with EC, and particularly in block, that we'll be able to tune it a little bit better. Uh, but you shouldn't expect too much because if there are two words that go together with erasure coding, is it's slow. <laughs> it's it's just true across the board. But we can tune it better than it is right now because there has been very little tuning done so far. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay, so. In my workplace, the team across the hall manages petabytes of storage, but our team, you know, manages dozens of very different applications, and they're primarily, you know, on virtual machine hard disks. We, we primarily want uh, storage, highly available storage for, uh, you know, our hypervisors and some smaller things too, like an FTP server and FS share and all. Mm -hmm. um, it could be any POSIX file system, you know, for that. I mean, if you're only talking about, say, like 100, 200 terabytes. 
of data and you know in the virtual machines like you could never have the cluster in read only mode if a uh, storage cluster is read only mode then all your like all your vms crash you know pretty much uh how well suited is uh is set for that for virtual machines and uh, highly available file systems? Yeah, high, high, virtual machines plus highly, you know, with high availability requirement, and also some other smaller high availability file systems, like, you know, and only talking about like 100, 100 200 terabytes of you know, data as seen by the virtual so, hypervisors and applications. I, I think the size in terms of the individual disks is not really a concern. Uh, it's more of a concern in terms of the total storage. I usually recommend that people don't look at software-defined storage, they're looking at less than a quarter petabyte or half a petabyte of total storage. Because, frankly, there are easier solutions. It's like a, just buy a Drobo or a QNAP or some kind of hardware appliance. But when you're reaching um, the quarter petabyte or half petabyte, it starts making sense to look at software-defined. If you're looking at things that are going to scale out aggressively, uh, so the storage amount that you're consuming is going to grow in the future, uh, that is also another scenario because uh, software-defined economics stay the same as you scale out. While um, when you try to provide storage scale out with appliances, there are huge discontinuities in what you're paying. So um, those are the, the sweet spots. In terms of uh, the technical side of this, I would say, um, Providing a virtual machine disks is our bread and butter in the OpenStack world, so I wouldn't worry about that use case. Uh, for the file system scenario, I would look into a little bit more detail, but um, generally it should, it should not be a problem. I mean, if you're providing a, a file system to back an FTP server, sure, that, I don't see a problem with that. Thank you. You said OpenStack is better suited for a virtual machine. Uh, uh, virtual hard disks? Uh, generally, the way we uh, deliver virtualization is in combination with OpenStack, yes. Okay. You, you could do KVM directly. Right. Um, oh, you mean OpenStack on top of a, a, a Ceph? Uh, OpenStack Ceph. is a virtualization. Oh, right. Yeah. So Ceph doesn't do virtualization, it only does storage. You have right, the yes. virtual machines that need to come from somewhere, right? I mean, Usually, oh, Ceph provides virtual machine storage to OpenStack. Right. We can do virtual machine storage with VMware, also in that case we have to use iSCSI. It's a little bit less funny. It's a little bit less fun. It's also possible. Right, I was just thinking, because I thought OpenStack also had its own storage stuff in it. Well, we, so Cinder Backend would be Ceph, yeah. or um, what your, your commands pool would be Ceph, because of those lines, but its images would be stored on Ceph. Okay. Or if your, uh, your disks would also be stored on Ceph. It's all defined in OpenStack. That makes sense, thank you. I can't hear you, Mike. Yeah. Well, I'm standing a mile away. Just basically, so so any, any of the configuration that's done pointing towards the back end will all be done in the OpenStack side of things. You could target your Cinder back end as Ceph, uh, glance, back, uh, glance images, location as Ceph, and things along those lines. You can think of OpenStack as a collection of standards, um, and then the implementations change. So for Cinder, there are like 60 different storage implementations, which are Cinder drivers. There used to be this joke that um, the um, the project technical lead for Cinder had more drivers than God, and I think we wanted to make business cards with him, for him with that. Um, with the exception of OpenStack Swift, everything else is decoupled from the implementation, so there are interface standards, and then there is the actual implementation underneath. Thank you. We have one last question, and then we need to move on. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you say that uh, Seth compares with a uh, proprietary file system like, uh, say, GPFS? Uh, that usually depends on what you're trying to do, so what, what the use case is. Uh, high performance computing. So high performance computing it tends to be pretty aggressive in terms of, uh, of the operations it does out of the file system. We haven't really uh, attacked that market um, strongly because it's, it's not something that is commercially uh, super interesting. Uh, but um, I think that CFFS has an opportunity there because of the, uh, the ability to scale metadata operations independently of the size of the cluster. That could be interesting in some cases. Um, I don't think that we're going to displace the traditional HPC stories there, in part because we're not super interested, in part because there are some specific problems to solve. <coughs> uh, but in, in some scenarios, it does make sense. Now, it's also... Um, 
um, there are also different properties. We uh, tend to be eventually consistent. I'm sorry, um, uh, we tend to be immediately consistent in the local cluster. But um, you have to look at whether that is the dynamic that you're looking for from the, your storage or some looser semantics. There are a number of things to look at. I would say in some use cases it would make sense. I wouldn't say that should displace um, the traditional HPC file systems wholesale. That is not something I would expect. Uh, is it possible to run Ceph over a high performance interconnect? We generally don't like that uh, because it just increases complexity and cost. It is technically possible. We like to use directly attached storage. So you have the servers that are from the vendor that you like to work with. We would, uh, we usually try to tune the choice of hardware. Do you mean disks or like InfiniBand? Yeah. Uh, InfiniBand. Yeah, not, not right. Really. I mean, people keep trying. Melnex keeps tagging characters, but it's not in great shape. If any band is tagged as experimental upstream and we actually acquired the company that was doing the work and we have them doing something else. So that is not progressing. <laughs> oh, we no, need, we needed another, that team. There's a whole other implementation now, Federico. So, oh, it's, there is a new one. Yeah. It's the oh. One, yeah. In any case, it's, it's, still, experimental. it's still experimental. And um, generally speaking, the way we optimize the problem is that we want the nodes to be as low cost as possible for the performance that you're going to get. In that scenario, it makes sense to choose a certain type of network, which is usually 210 gigabit um, bonded, and local storage, because it's going to give you the best bang for your buck. Um, things like InfiniBand give you CPU offload, which would be nice. But in general, we, in general, we find that that is not optimal in terms of cost and effort for the vast majority of the user base. There are a couple of um, not HPC, but uh, university computing scenarios where that may make sense. But again, as we were saying with Greg, it's still experimental, so we, we haven't done it yet. Okay, thanks. Well, thank you very much.